You need help feeding your babies. God bless your darling heart. You need to be tithing off that help. Well, dear Lord, Brother Copeland, I'm in poverty now. I know it. I'm telling you how to get out. That's the gospel. I grew up in a family of Catholics, but I wouldn't particularly identify myself as a religious person today. As I walk the path of life, a lot is not adding up, and it begs the question, what is a church? Is it a social group, an event center, or a business arena where blessings and supposed miracles are exchanged for money? There are literally 1,189 chapters in the Word of God. For every chapter in the Word of God, I'm going to ask a partner of this ministry to sow what I call a turnaround seed. I'm going to ask you to name this seed a turnaround seed. Somebody is watching that this $100 seed is going to be a turnaround in your family and in your marriage. In the vast world of religious practice, churchgoers across different denominations are often subjected to financial obligations that, to some, may seem excessive or unfair. This is the concept we refer to as financial slavery in the church. 21 people in this building that God said will give $1,000. He said 21 people in this building come now wherever you are. Give me an envelope. Give me some envelopes. This term encapsulates the scenario where church members feel obligated, pressured, or manipulated into giving more financially than they can comfortably afford. The financial contributions range from tithes and offerings to donations towards church projects, and sometimes, even personal gifts to church leaders. You know, I've owned three different jets in my life, and I and used them and just burning them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to believe me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. He's asking his followers for the $54 million. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. In some instances, these financial obligations are presented as a prerequisite for divine blessings, creating a transactional narrative around God's grace and favor. The concept of financial slavery in the church is not just about the money that changes hands, but also about the psychological and emotional burden that these financial obligations place on individuals and families. The act and sermon of giving has become a tool for exploitation used by pastors, prophets and televangelists around the world. When I, when I was in prayer this morning, Pastor Benny, the Lord brought to me and he said that there are 52 weeks in a year. There are 52 weeks in a year. I want every single individual that is, that, that's in their capacity, and, or, or if they can't, they need to get the closest to it. I want them to stretch out their faith, and I would like them to sow a $52 seed for 52 weeks of favor. Can you, you felt this was from the I, Lord this morning? I felt, this from this, I felt it this morning that this was from the Lord. Some churchgoers convince themselves to be giving freely and willingly, but for the most part, that is not the case. They do so under duress, out of fear, or in hopes of receiving miracles and blessings. The church in its modern form is not bothered by the financial strengths and personal finance of its members, but instead, hype them with mega events, fake miracles, motivational speeches, and drain their pockets even more. In this video, we will discuss the financial slavery in the church. I'm getting laid off at work. Hey, your job's not your source. If it is, you're in trouble. Jesus is your source. Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. Don't you stop sowing offerings. Well, they won't let us go to church. Well, email it in there, text the give or something, but you get your tithe in that church. If you have to go take it down there and drop it off and the, unstick it under the door or something, you get that tithe in that church. Tithing, a term often used in religious circles, is a practice with a rich backstory. Originating from the Old Testament of the Bible, the word tithe literally translates to one-tenth. It was a commandment given for one to give one-tenth of their crops and livestock to support the Levites, who were the religious leaders of the time. Over time, the concept of tithing evolved. With the advent of money as a medium of exchange, tithing began to be understood as giving one-tenth of one's income. Modern churches apply tithing in different ways. In many churches, not paying your tithe is tantamount to committing a spiritual or religious crime against God. Many are intimidated by church leaders to cough up these amounts, irrespective of their own bills or pending financial responsibilities. Tithing is a test. God is testing your heart. The very fact that you would argue with God, who gave His Son for you, about giving Him 10%. He gave His Son, and you want to argue about 10%. Because churches are not audited in most countries, 
church leaders mostly reserve the right on how they use the funds they collect, and you dare not question them. Your job is to pay and don't bother about what happens thereafter. Your pastor will get it to God. Many have contributed more to tithing than they have in their personal savings or investment accounts. And when they find themselves in financial struggles, in most instances, when they look up to the church for help, the church will ask them to pray. However, when the pastor has a financial problem, the church takes care of him and his family. You need help feeding your babies. God bless your darling heart. You need to be tithing off that help. Well, dear Lord, Brother Copeland, I'm in poverty now. I know it. I'm telling you how to get out. That's the gospel. Another questionable act leading many into serious financial slavery is a practice known as first fruit. Churchgoers are asked to bring all of their income for the first month of the year to the church, or let me say it right, bring it all to God. Yes, everything you earn in the first month of every year. First fruit shows your gratitude to God for the extra blessing he has bestowed upon you. You can give it to the temple or to the church, or you can give it to the minister. Honor the Lord with your first fruits, and he will bless you in abundance. So there is an abundant harvest returning to you on your gift. The practice of tithing and first fruit has indeed become a religious practice gradually dragging many into financial ruins. As if that is not enough, what follows next will shock you. Release that anointing! If God is speaking to you to sow $1,000 seeds tonight, I'm asking for those amounts because I want to see your faith released tonight. When you sow larger amounts, you release faith. And when faith is released, God Almighty will release the harvest. That's just the way it works, people. At its core, the prosperity gospel is a belief within many Christian denominations and megachurches that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. This doctrine did not just appear out of thin air. It has its roots in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, largely in America. Leaders of the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements began to emphasize divine healing, abundance, and personal success as a part of the Christian life. You know, I figured out something, ladies and gentlemen. See, Satan doesn't want you to realize that every dime he's got belongs to you. As long, my sister, I know you've been reading the Bible, but as long as we say it's laid up, the wicked are gonna keep it. But God says it's time for us to tell that money, you don't belong to the wicked, you belong to us. And I want you to get in the right place. Money coming to me now. It was from these teachings that the prosperity gospel began to take shape. Over time, the doctrine evolved and expanded with televangelists and mega church pastors preaching the prosperity gospel to millions around the globe. They often encourage their followers to sow a seed, a term used to describe financial gifting, with the promise that God will bless them abundantly in return. I want you to go to the phone, dial the number on the screen and simply say, I'm one of the 1,000. I'm going to faith in somehow in 90 days a thousand dollar seed. You may already have the thousand. It may be something you put aside for retirement or a college or a vacation. You may have put some money aside that nobody knows about and God's giving you a picture. It may be in the bottom of your closet. It may be in a sock. Maybe between your mattresses. It may be an account that nobody knows about but you and God. That's not your harvest. That thousand dollars won't get you anywhere until God touches it. I have a feeling that somebody that wants a credit card debt wiped out, that if you'll use your faith as you sow, as you sow the thousand on a credit card, God's going to wipe out your credit card indebtedness. The prosperity gospel has led to an influx of money into churches, monies that church leaders misuse for personal gain, leading to scandals and mistrust. When it comes to churchgoers paying up in hopes of the said divine prosperity, it creates unrealistic expectations and pressures, especially among those who are less fortunate. They may feel obligated to give more than they can afford in the hopes of receiving a financial miracle. One interesting aspect of the prosperity gospel is, when an individual do not receive the said miracle or financial blessings after paying up or sowing a seed, the blame is mostly on them and not the pastor or the church or God. 
individuals rather condemn themselves as not being fit for the requested blessings or miracle, or may not have given much, or didn't have much faith to command the desired blessings. It is a concept that is still not clear, and the church is silent on these issues focused on milking its members dry, running them deep into financial slavery. Indeed, the prosperity gospel is cash cow for preachers and churches, pretending to give hope and encouragement to its members, but at the core of it is an agenda, an agenda to enrich pastors, prophets and church leaders. What is even more concerning that happens in almost every church in the world is congregational pressures. Congregational pressures are an often overlooked aspect of church life. This invisible force can play a significant role in leading individuals towards financial slavery within the church. Let's shed some light on this issue. Congregational pressures can come in varied forms. For instance, there's the subtle pressure to donate generously, which can be communicated through sermons or testimonies of other church members. The underlying message is often this, the more you give, the more you're blessed. This creates an environment where giving more than one can afford becomes a norm, leading to financial strain. Then, there's the pressure to live up to an image of prosperity. In some congregations, there's an unspoken expectation that members should portray a certain level of wealth or success. This can lead to individuals living beyond their means, feeling compelled to contribute more than they can afford to maintain the illusion of prosperity. You can't see what's not seen until you let go of what is seen. And that's, I'm talking about your money, because your money is you. It's your blood, it's your sweat, your tears, it's driving down the freeways, it's going to work, it's believing, it's you. And letting go of it. Peer pressure also plays a significant role. Church members might feel obliged to match or surpass the donations of their peers. If a fellow member announces a large donation, others may feel compelled to give the same amount or more, regardless of their personal financial situation. There are also instances where members are encouraged to make pledges or vows of financial commitment. These pledges, often made in public during a service, can be incredibly binding. The fear of breaking a vow made before God and the congregation can lead to individuals feeling trapped in a cycle of giving they can't sustain. Here's a thousand dollar vow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You say you, you want to make a five hundred dollar vow? Then do it. Then do it. You want to make a hundred dollar vow? Or say, I like a thousand because I know I got gotcha. you. Also, most churches make use of fundraising campaigns that create a sense of urgency or competition. These campaigns often set high financial targets and use tactics like progress charts or public acknowledgments to encourage more giving. The pressure to contribute and help reach the target can lead to individuals giving more than they can afford. All these pressures, subtle or overt, can lead to a state of financial slavery where members feel compelled to give, even when it's detrimental to their financial well-being. These pressures can sometimes extend to the realm of fake miracles and prophecies. If you could have a miracle, what would you want it to be? Then I can walk. Just walk. Is that what you want, Grace? Just to walk? Just to walk. Born with curvature of the joints, Grace Brillat de Fernie, B.C. was just eight years old when we met her at a crusade in Calgary, hoping to be healed by the man known as Pastor Benny. It was something that I focused on for like 18 years of my life. and Focused um, on it in what way? Just the, the healing and you kind of think, oh, it's going to happen today, it'll happen this time, and that it's going to be, your life's going to change. In Calgary, Grace's mother Janice carried her to the stage, but before long, they were stopped by the screeners who keep the truly sick and disabled away from Benny Hinn. The allure of miracles and prophecies can be a powerful tool in the hands of the unscrupulous. Imagine this, a charismatic figure stands on a pulpit, claiming to possess divine insights. They tell you that they've received a prophecy, a vision of a future where you're blessed with wealth and prosperity. All you need to do is sow a seed, a financial gift, to unlock this divine promise. It's a compelling narrative, isn't it? This is not an uncommon occurrence in many religious settings. People are promised miracles and prophecies, but at a price. And that price is not just financial. It's the cost of blind faith, of surrendering reason and logic to the promise of a miracle that may never come. It's the cost of hope exploited, 
trust broken, the allure of miracles and prophecies is like a quick drug to the despair, and these pastors and churches know that and they exploit it. The promise of a miracle can be a beacon of hope giving the belief that better days are coming. This is why fake miracles and prophecies are effective tools for financial manipulation. So when, when he promises, and that's what he does do, he promises that today's the day for your healing, for your miracle, and it doesn't happen, you blame yourself. Yes. First and foremost. Yes. And I think he, he takes advantage of people who are, um, who are vulnerable. Pastor, she had epilepsy. Go see Jesus' name. They tap into our deepest desires and fears, promising a solution, but at a cost. But why does this happen? How can people fall for such obvious manipulations? The answer lies in our human nature. We are wired to seek answers, to find meaning in our lives. And when someone claims to have those answers, to possess divine knowledge, it can be hard to resist. However, it's crucial to remember that true miracles and prophecies don't come with a price tag. They are not commodities to be bought and sold. It is clear that these manipulations often stem from fear and manipulation tactics. Fear and manipulation tactics are unfortunately common in cases of financial slavery in the church. One of the most potent tools used to maintain this form of financial enslavement is fear. Fear, in its many forms, can be a powerful motivator, compelling congregants to give beyond their means in the hope of divine intervention or to avoid divine retribution. This fear is often stoked by tales of woe and misfortune, befalling those who fail to give adequately or regularly to the church. Another fear-based tactic is the threat of spiritual consequences. Some churches propagate the belief that withholding tithes and offerings may result in a lack of blessings or even curses from God. If God causes you, to whom will you run? It's a dangerous thing to rob God. Every robber who robbed God of his tithes and offering is under a curse. This manipulative tactic instills a deep-seated fear in congregants, making them feel obligated to give, even when it strains their finances. Beyond fear, manipulation is another prevalent tactic. Manipulation in the church can take many forms, but one particularly insidious method is the misuse of scripture. Certain verses are cherry-picked and interpreted in ways that support the idea of financial giving as a prerequisite for divine favor. This manipulation of holy texts can make it difficult for congregants to question or resist the pressure to give. Lastly, the tactic of emotional manipulation. Stories of miraculous financial breakthroughs following significant offerings are shared to inspire and encourage congregants to give more. These stories prey on the hopes and dreams of congregants, manipulating their emotions for financial gain. Understanding these tactics can help us to navigate and combat financial slavery in the church. By recognizing these fear and manipulation tactics, we can challenge them, engage in informed discussions, and ultimately protect ourselves, our families, and our communities from financial exploitation. Now, it's your turn to join the discussion. How do these factors resonate with your own experiences? What solutions can we, as a society, propose to address this issue? Are there other aspects of financial slavery in the church we've missed? Share your views on this in the comment section, share this video with others and remember to subscribe.